start with some questions first. Well, we get the slides up. Is that all right? A little bit loud, perhaps? No, good. Okay. So, welcome to EAGX Flanders, everyone. It's so great to see so many people here in one room. I think I, uh, especially with such a new group and only a few events with a couple of people, but just by putting out the word, we suddenly got so many faces in the room. So, I just kind of want to get a bit of a sense of how many people have how many people have been to an EA-related event before? Just show of hands. Wow, just a few. And how many of you have read about effective altruism online? Almost everyone. Fantastic. Well, it sounds like you guys are going to have to start a group here in Belgium so you can have many more events and get to know each other, discuss these ideas a bit further after the conference. So, as you've, as you've already heard, effective altruism at its core is about so this desire to do good, to do as much good as we can, uh, and to use evidence and reason to figure out how to do good, combined with the sort of audacity to actually try, to sort of direct that, in that good intention, that evidence, to a real impact in the world. So we'll throw out some more questions. So, how many of you, you think that sounds like a good idea? Doing good in the world? Yep. Anyone think that sounds terrible? No one? Normally we have at least a couple of people who put up their hands at that one, and then we get to have a nice argument about it later. But no, okay, so we're all on board with the first part. What about using evidence and reason to figure out how we can do the most good? I think this, this is an idea that's spread through uh, movements like evidence-based medicine and policy, and now this is becoming a big thing in the world of charity. So, what about that one? Good idea? Oh, this is going to be easy. <laughs> now, the hard one. How many of you are actually doing something in your everyday lives to make the world much better. Well, hopefully today we'll talk through some of the different uh, actions that you can take in effective altruism and maybe some small changes that you might be able to take, something that you can do to make, to direct that, all that energy and talent towards doing even better, making an even bigger difference, helping more people. Yeah. Success! <laughs> So this is just going to be a bit of an introduction. So as I said, yeah, effective altruism is this. This is this nice quote that some of my colleagues came up with a couple of years ago. And you know, they put it in these lofty big terms that effective altruism is the desire to make the, the world as good a place as it can possibly be, the use of evidence and reason to figure out how to best to do so, and the audacity to actually try. And you know. I'm not one for such sort of lofty sentiments. So instead, I like to think of effective altruism as these four really simple ideas that I think everyone in this room can agree to. So the first one, that it's good to help others. And I think everyone in this room would agree with that. That part of leading an ethical life and just being a, a good person means helping others when it's trivial or easy to do so. And when when helping someone else would be at little or no cost to yourself. So I think everyone here would, wouldn't even hesitate to help a friend or a relative if they were suffering, or if, and if you could you know, help them move their groceries a couple of metres. No one would say, oh, no, I'm not going to do that, that's too hard. So, next. Effective altruism holds that all people are equal. So... We have this desire to help others, to help people who are close to us, who we have a special relationship with. But over the last sort of hundred years or so, we've seen a huge rise in this idea that we should that part of being a good person and leading a good life is avoiding discrimination. And it's sort of that when we think about who we should help and how to do good, we shouldn't choose what we do on the basis of what country someone is born in, or what, what skin colour or eye colour they have, or you know what degree they studied at university. I think all of us probably think doing that would be quite absurd. So effective altruism holds that people are equal, and that means that 
sometimes the people who we can help the easiest and for in the most trivial ways with the least sacrifice to ourselves are people who are quite different from us, people who live on the other side of the world and quite far away from us, rather than the people living in the same cities or towns as ourselves. So next is that it's better, if you can, for the same amount of resources or time, it's better to help more people rather than fewer people. So let's say you have $100 to give out and you, can, you, want to buy a, you want to buy a bag of apples. Let's say you want to spend $100 buying apples. And at one store, they cost $1 each. So you could buy 100 apples and give them to all of your friends. And at another store, you could get twice as many and give them out to 200 of your friends. I think, you know, if they're exactly the same product, most of us would get the 200 apples instead. And so we think the same thing applies to doing good. That if one charity or one particular organization is much more effective than another one, then we should choose the one which will help benefit more people rather than fewer for the same, same amount of resources put in. But the last one is where we have to make some difficult choices. So given that we all agree that it's good to help others if we can, that people are equal, and that it's better to help more people rather than fewer, the problem is there are so many problems in the world. So I think when I was really young and I was first thinking about how I could best do good, I looked around and I saw all the, that there were millions of people living in poverty in the world, that there were 65 million children who weren't in school, that there were animals suffering on factory farms and countless other horrors throughout the world. And unfortunately, over my lifetime, I wouldn't have enough time to focus on all of them. So you have to choose. And we live in a world where we don't have infinite resources, where each of us has only a certain amount of time, certain amount of money that we can direct towards doing good. So given that, we're going to have to prioritize. We have to find the best interventions that we can find in order to do the most good with the resources that we do have. And so a lot of the time this can sound pretty unfair. You know, we have to have these arguments about well, my cause is better than, other, than yours, you should give to this organisation, and that means neglecting something else that's really, really important. But effective altruism is about saying, yes, all of these things are really important. These are all terrible, hard problems that we need to tackle at some point. But in the meantime, with what we have, we're going to do as much good as we can and work our way down that list and get to all of the biggest problems eventually. The other big problem with this is that when we think about doing good, it's hard to get enough information to tell us which actions are the most effective, which charities are the best ones to donate to. And it's very different to buying that bag of apples. You know, you can like pick it up, look at it, take a bite, and then you instantly know how good that apple is. So when we buy a product, we get instant feedback, and we know exactly what we're going to get. Whereas instead, if you make a donation to a charity, what, what happens? Maybe they send you an email, a nice card with lots of pretty pictures, and then that creates this, sense, this warm, fuzzy feeling. So you, you feel like you've done a good action. But the problem is, almost every charity will do that. And some charities can be much more effective than others. So our feedback loop is quite poor. And that's because these problems are really complicated, and it's really, really hard to know which, which charities and which things are actually the most effective. So let's run through some more examples. So this is one of my favorite stories, and this is about a group of people who ran uh, fundraising activities in Scotland. So in Scotland, uh, it became quite popular to go skydiving for charity. So it's quite similar to a fun run. So a lot of people would raise money from their friends and family and then jump out of a plane um, and you know, jo donate to a particular organization. Um, so some of these people raised thousands of pounds for charity. So who thinks this put out, let's have a show of hands. So if you think this was overall a good thing for the world, 
hands up. Overall, a bad uh, neutral, just just like this, and a bad thing, no hands. Hands. So hands up if it's, this is overall a good thing for the world. Well, oh, lots of people. Well, turns out skydiving is pretty dangerous. So a lot of the people who went skydiving for charity sprained their ankle, broke their leg, pulled a muscle, and in fact, for every dollar that these people raised for charity, it cost the healthcare system $14. <laughs> and the, the thing that was the most funny about this is a lot of these people were actually raising money for the NHS, for the national healthcare system. So, you know, <laughs> it was good. they were losing them quite a lot of money. Uh, you know, fun runs are much better, actually, much less injury prone, but it just shows how having good intentions doesn't give us all the answers. And even if we think we're doing something that's really good, and we are, in fact, moving money to charity, if we don't take into account some of these other side effects and don't, like, really consider what we're doing, we can end up doing more harm than good. So another program that's become sort of infamous now is this program run in the US called Scared Straight. So this was a program designed to tackle juvenile delinquency. And they took children uh, and adolescents who had committed very minor offences and been given a warning, and they gave them a day in prison, this sort of real-life experience. And the idea being that they could you know, give, give these kids a, a bit of a shock. And you can see that it says reality check. So they're getting a taste of what their life would be like if they continued down this path into a life of crime and sort of followed the footsteps of some of their relatives or some of their friends later. So they were shouted at by the guards, they had to sort of go under those harsh chemical showers and they even experienced some periods of like uh, an hour spent in solitary confinement. And at the end of that, they were paired up with mentors to help them get advice over the period. Then they tell the story of this one boy, Jeffrey, who beforehand he'd uh, been arrested three different times for petty theft. And, you know, at the end of this program, he meets his mentor and he graduates from high school and he gets into one, a great college in the US. So, sounds like a great story, right? So, you guys probably get the gist of this one now, but who thinks this had, you know, for these children later on in their lives, who thinks that they committed, uh, that they, this program worked, that they committed less crime? <laughs> The, the same amount? Same amount? And anyone think that perhaps they committed more crime? Yeah. You guys, you guys got it. So what actually happened is children who went through this program ended up being much more likely to get arrested as adults than the children who didn't. So again, a program had good intentions. This program was rolled out into 30 different states in the US. Millions and millions of dollars of government money and donations went into this program. And yet, it was just increasing the amount of time that young people were spending in prison. Another one fraught with danger is volunteering. So previously, there have been a lot of corporate volunteering campaigns. And the, the thing I love is when you see a big law firm or a corporate accounting firm, and they get everyone to go out and paint a fence or work in a soup kitchen for a day. And in this image, what actually happened is this particular soup kitchen uh, it used to hire people who are homeless and pay them a living wage to work in the soup kitchen. Uh, but they had so many people wanting to come in and volunteer that they actually fired all of those people and instead switched to being volunteer run. So, you know, you get lawyers and doctors and other people displacing homeless people from jobs where they could otherwise make a living. So, yeah, instead, perhaps, some of these people could do a lot more good if they worked for a couple of hours and then donated the money to support that soup kitchen. So this is an interesting study from the Coalition for Evidence-Based Policy, and it looked at a lot of interventions like this, like Scared Straight and like many other programs, and it found that 75% or more of social interventions have small or no effects. And so this is a small study just conducted in the US looking at a pretty narrow range of different programs, but I find it so surprising to think that you know, there are all these people out there who their main aim is to do good. They have the best intentions. Uh, they give it their all. It's not, these people aren't, you know, they're not, it's not like they're not well educated, they're not smart, they're not trying hard enough. These are everyday people just like you and I, who just are uh, trying to do good, but unfortunately just happen to find an intervention that doesn't work very well. So what we propose instead 
is looking at the evidence, testing things, running trials, figuring out what works, and then diverting all of our time and resources to only the things which are most effective. So, you guys in the audience might be thinking, okay, I, I've got the hang of this now. I think I'll be able to pick which things are the best and which things aren't. So let's go through an example. So let's say you've decided that you want to focus on improving education. And there are many charities which focus on education all over the world. And there are lots and lots of different reasons people give for why many children aren't in school. So I've seen lots of different ones. They'll, they'll tell a great story, like, okay, the reason that many female children aren't in school is because they don't have good sanitary facilities in schools, or it's because children can't afford their school uniforms, or it's because uh, many families think that it's, it's too expensive to send their female children to school when they could be working in the, in the home and saving their family money. So the first program provided yeah, free school uniforms to all students regardless. Just You had to go to the school, pick up a school uniform, uh, and then the children could go. Then the second program provided cash transfers to the parents and families of uh, girl children to try and incentivize them to actually send their female children to school. And then the last one was an academic scholarship for female children who performed really well at school because there was this idea that it was there was a misunderstanding amongst families who didn't who were sort of worried that their female children were, weren't actually progressing as well in their studies as some of the other children. So by providing scholarships to uh, top performing students to try and incentivize them to get their children to stay in school, they thought they might be able to boost attendance rates. So if you have to donate to one of these programs, which one would you choose? So, who thinks that the most effective one is the free school uniforms? Free school uniforms? How about conditional cash transfers? And what about merit scholarships? But we have a lot of undecided people in the audience, I think. Uh, I guess this means you think we should look at the studies, right? Yes. <laughs> so, turns out that free school uniforms, so if you have $1,000 and in, you give them it to this charity, you can get 7.1 years of additional schooling. That's 10 times better than the worst performing one, conditional cash transfers. So, by looking, running this study and figuring it out, for the same amount of money, we can do 10 times as good. And if the thing that we care about is children in school, that's incredible. So it's such a great opportunity. But that's not the best one. The people who ran this study sort of were, their main background was in education, but they were talking to some doctors in the area. They heard about this thing uh, one, where one of the issues might actually be that a lot of the children were missing school because they were ill with intestinal worms. And this is a uh, type of worm that's very it's endemic in Kenya, and it causes a lot of nausea, lack of concentration, so when children have this worm, they perform worse in school and they miss many days. And once they start missing school, many kids drop out. And we have a treatment for this worm. It's very common. It's a very old medicine. It costs less than 50 cents per treatment. So by instituting a deworming program in Kenya, for $1,000, they were able to buy 125 years of additional schooling. That's incredible. That's 100 times better. And it can get even more than that. So Toby Ord, who uh, is one of the founders of CEA, wrote this paper where he compared the very worst interventions he could find, those which have little or no effect, to the very best we can find. And the difference between those is about 15,000 times bigger. So that means if we move the $1 that we might have given to some of the worst charities in the world to the very best, rather than saving one life for that dollar, we could save an entire village or an entire city. So I think that means that even a modest amount of resources can do a huge amount of good if we just direct it to the very most effective areas. So effective altruism at its core is about combining both the heart, this deep desire to do good and caring about the world, with the head, some reasoning, some analysis, looking at the studies to figure out how we can do the most good for our dollar. But it's also action-oriented. 
So EA is not just about talking about these ideas, coming to meetups, going to parties. Yes. <laughs> yeah, EA is about taking action. So we think it's not enough to tweet about these problems or share them on Facebook. Uh, we want people to actually go out into the world and make donations and really consider these problems when they think about their career or where they might volunteer, what skills they want to gain. So, one thing, one of the best ways to take action in the world is to think about where, what we do with our money. So, who's heard of the, the uh, Occupy Wall Street campaign? <coughs> almost everyone, great. So all these people were standing around with post-its saying, we are the 99%, yeah? So they, they say that, you know, there's these, these rich people up here who earn much, much, much more than everyone else, uh, so that their income should be redistributed. And that's true. So the difference between people is extreme. So you can see the dark lines at the end of this graph. And in fact, I've had to cut the graph off because if I was to try and graph the income of everyone in the entire world using this scale, that graph would go 40 stories into the air. So there really is such a huge, huge difference between the very poorest people in the world and the very richest people in the world. But So here in Belgium, who thinks that we're in the top 50% of the world's income? Yeah, for sure, for yourself, top 50%. Who thinks we're at least 70% still? What about in the top top ten percent? Do you think we're about here? Well, going you're going further. What's your what's your number? Oh. Five. Top three percent. You are you must have seen my slides. <laughs> <laughs> so. If you live in Belgium and you have a, a pretty average income, so I've taken the, income, the uh, median income level for people who are very similar to us in Belgium, so about 30,000 euros, then that puts you in the richest 2.8% of the world's population. And that means your income is more than 25 times the global average. So really, it's not just those fat cats on Wall Street who should be doing a lot of good. It, it's people like you and me. It's like we are the global elite in some sense, and we should give back as well. So, what can we get for a thousand euros? If we were to take some of the money that, you know, maybe that we spend on frivolous things that we don't really need or on things that don't really actually make us any happier and instead give that to some of the very best causes, how much good could we do just as average everyday people? So we know some ways of helping are a thousand times better than others. So let's look at some comparisons. So in the next few slides, each one of these little hearts represents a week of healthy life, a, a week in perfect health. And we're going to think about how many weeks of perfect health we can buy with this thousand dollars given to very different areas. So, in the UK, in Belgium, and in all, most developed countries, there's a an illness called Kaposi's sarcoma, which I used to treat when I worked as a pharmacist in Australia, and it's these horrible lesions. It's uh, it's a viral disease, but it's generally uh, related to advanced AIDS. And it causes these really disfiguring lesions on the nose, in the oral cavity, and down the throat. And when they get really bad, they can interfere with speaking, eating, and drinking. So this is a disease that really affects people's quality of life. And in the UK and in Australia, we think that it's a pretty good buy if for a thousand euros we can treat Kaposi sarcoma and give someone one week of healthy life per thousand dollars. So almost all developed countries spend this much for one week of healthy life. But if we were instead to spend that thousand euros on antiretroviral drugs to prevent the disease from getting to that state where it's quite bad, then we can get 100-ish 100 100 weeks of healthy life. So that's about two years for the same amount of money. So even though that suffering from those people over here is horrible, and pe these people experience really negative quality of life, we can do so much more by instead giving to antiretroviral therapy. And of course, it gets even better. If we spend that thousand euros on distributing condoms 
to prevent the spread of HIV, then we can get eight years of healthy life by preventing many, many more cases of HIV. So reducing a lot more suffering for a lot more people by focusing on prevention. But then the interesting thing is, if we were to look outside of HIV AIDS altogether and go into another cause area completely, then we can do even better. Sorry, I got the numbers wrong. This one's only four years. Condom distribution's not as good. So yeah, if instead we took this thousand euros and used it to buy bed nets in countries where malaria is endemic, where two people can sleep under one of these bed nets and they'll stop them getting bitten by mosquitoes, which transmit malaria, then for a thousand euros we can buy eight years of healthy life. That's 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 incredible. So you know, our governments think that it's a really good buy to spend a thousand euros on Kaposi's sarcoma, but if instead we could move just a small part of that money to, to bed nets or to some of these other more effective causes, we can do thousands of times more good. So, effective altruism is a community of people all over the world who take these values and these questions really seriously. So we had a big conference where we had over a thousand people and worldwide, there are somewhere between 10 and 20,000 people who committed to using evidence and reason to find the very best interventions. So the people in this crowd, the people over the world, all over the world, they're students, professionals, researchers, bloggers, activists. They're all different types of people who share the same goals and mission and think about how they can use their skills and resources to do the most good. And supporting them is a bunch of different organisations. So we have the Centre for Effective Altruism, where I work at. We mostly focus on sort of spreading the word, promoting effective altruism, and organising the community so that people can share what they've learned and talk about the research and compare the very best interventions. Then we have Giving What We Can, which Sam will talk about, which is a community of people who commit to donating 10% of their income to the very best causes that we find. And then um, we have a lot of different research organisations as well who look at like particular areas where they think they can find really great opportunities and figure out how to compare them against others. So you can look into some of those later. So in EA, we look at not just improvements within causes, so given that I care about education, what's the best thing I can donate to? We also try to find improvements between causes. So effective altruists, spend a lot of time thinking about how they can do even better by this idea of expanding the moral circle. So we realise that we can do a lot more good by, instead of just caring about our immediate family and friends, by sort of thinking about people on the other side of the world who maybe we can help more cheaply. Then beyond that, by thinking about, uh, say, the suffering of animals. There are many more times more animals living in the world than they are humans. And if we think that their suffering matters even a little bit, but then we can get reduced suffering by quite a lot, maybe even a lot more than we can by getting, focusing on humans, by looking at some of the very worst cases of suffering in, um, in factory farming. And beyond that, we need to think about things on a world scale. So there are some things that could occur in the future, perhaps particularly bad disasters that could affect many, many millions of people all over the world. And if we can reduce that by even a small chance, then we could do a lot of good. So we look at direct interventions focused on helping people right now, but often people who live quite far away from us and who are quite who are distant. We try to we try to look at areas which might be neglected because humans are mainly mainly sort of focused on the people who are close to them. So we focus a lot on uh, animal suffering in factory farm as well. We think about the long run future about what things might happen that we can prevent now, uh, particularly very large disasters. And then also, we try to learn more about how the world works. So a lot of EAs work on research uh, in psychology, in policy, and doing other things to try and figure out where the next best set of interventions might come from. And we, we call this idea Cause X. So there are a bunch of EAs who are, trying, who are working hard to answer this question to find out Okay, well, how can we ensure that we create more stable governments which are focused on doing good? Can we use advocacy to do even more good? Are there other uh, interventions we might be neglecting that need more research? So, 
Effective altruism answers this question. We each have the power to have an extraordinary impact over the course of our lifetimes, either by donating just a small portion of our income or by using some of our time more effectively. I think every person in this room can, you know, I think we can save at least 40 lives each in our lifetime. And for me, that's just incredible. I think that's, that's far more good than I ever thought that I could do before I found some of these really, really impressive interactions. And at its core, EA is very simple. It's these basic premises that we care about doing good in the world, that we want to use evidence and reason to find the very best ways of doing so, and that we want to take action on the basis of those beliefs, direct our money, our time, and our attention to the very best causes so that we can actually really move the needle and make real change in the world. And it's a community of people all over the world who share those ideas, talk about them, and try to figure out what we should each do to make a difference in the world. To help as much as possible. And you'll get to hear much more about all the other different ways that we've discovered so far over the rest of this conference. So thank you.